we 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 did this change up. Um, let me do just a little bit of this. I I don't know if I've done this when you've been on, Linda, but but uh, it's always it's always good to to emphasize where these teachings uh, come from, and of course, um, uh, Dr. George Lamsa uh, is the guy that introduced Aramaic on the scene. Um, uh, basically, it, I mean, he, he kind of started in 1933 with the Gospels, but, but he translated the entire Bible uh, and finished it in like 1957. And at that point in time, the world, it, and it, it is true, he introduced Aramaic and this translation of the Bible to the world um, in 1957. And um, so he is unique, he is special because um, he grew up in the Kurdistan mountains, very remote. And that remote village where he grew up had not had any contact with the civilized world since, since the time of Jesus and uh and and even before because he because he is an assyrian and so so what makes him special and why why we understand the work in the bible the way we do is because his native language was aramaic um and the village was was almost identical to the way jesus was raised the culture the people, the customs, and he brought that with him. So I'm just saying nowadays, uh, be careful of what's out there. And they say, okay, this 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 is Aramaic, okay? Now, a lot of people have gotten interested in the Aramaic translations, okay? And they're making translations. But, but in addition to the translations, what we look at here is the spirit of the word. And and the whole Amer Aramaic uh, approach and interpretation is basically a spiritual approach, and it it, it just um, well, it's just really great to me, and it does make a difference. And of course, Dr. Erico actually mentored under Dr. Lamsa for ten years. And so he was able to, well, he experienced uh, many of the customs firsthand because Dr. Lanza, though he came, he came to this country and he went to the theology school and whatnot, but, you know, the customs, some of the customs and stuff stayed with him. So Dr. Eric will not only learn from him, uh, he, he learned, experienced some of the customs. And uh, so he has contributed to the expansion of, of his work. And so anyway, I just thought I would take tonight and talk about that. Thank you. Can I say something? I that. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that his small book on the idioms of the Bible were so helpful also because so much of what's written doesn't seem to make sense because we don't understand the idiom. Exactly. Uh, it, it does. And, um, we're hopeful here at the Institute, matter of fact, um, to come out with, we've added to that book um, a good bit. And, uh, but anyway, over time, <laughs> we we hope to, be, because, um, and hopefully soon, uh, we're going to start classes in the seven keys. And I'm going to start mentioning it here because that's what helps to understand the Bible. There is the translation, but, um, you, you know, as it's translated, and that makes a difference, but um, but understanding the culture and the, the idioms, like you said, and, and the, the symbolism, uh, um, it's just amazing. But if you've ever read the prophets and you don't understand um, we call it mysticism or symbolism, then you do not know, you cannot understand what the 
prophets are talking about um, because the prophets are all visions and visions when you receive a vision uh, for, for the most part they come in symbols and so if you don't understand the symbols you don't really know what it's saying so anyway and so um, I I'm the penny part of this, and um, Reverend Martin is still is is now in spirit, but um, but he's a, he's our spiritual advisor, and um, so we studied directly under Dr. Erico for 13 years, and then we uh, then we moved out for the last uh, five or six years. I don't know how many. We just um, we moved we moved out on our own literally moved because we were in an RV for three years, but we kept the classes going while we were in the RV. And uh, I can only I can only say that it has really, it's really made a difference. When you understand th this approach, and once you understand it, it seems so simple, but it's complicated to deal with, so, okay. All right, and, and of course, this is, we're not here to convince you of anything. We're not here to coerce you, uh, certainly not to convert you. And, uh, and so we're not here to condemn you, your religion or your beliefs. Um, everyone has their own set of beliefs. You may, you have your religion and whatnot, but um, this is an educational, this is an educational institution. Um, you learn what we have. Um, and then you use it just like all any other education you get. Uh, you use it or you don't, but you know that's up to you. So, all right. Uh, so Pentecost. Um, I, I I just just thought we would do Pentecost in in the Christian churches. Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday. Um, I think the actual Pentecost date, which is 50 days after Easter is um, uh, is Monday the 20 the 28th but uh, but I just thought and, and I have and I have some things in here uh, from Dr. Lonsa Dr. Lonsa uh, I have an article that Dr. Lonsa did about Pentecost and so um, it's it's um, it's about what Pentecost is, what the Holy Spirit is, and um, and then of course we always apply it to ourselves, our world. So here we go. Um, let's see here. George, are you open to read scripture? I know I caught yes, you. Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. What we're going to do is just I'm going to read the scriptures first, and okay. then and then we're going to then we're just going to go through some explanations. Okay, go ahead, George. Okay, Acts two two eight, and when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, while they were assembled together, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues which were divided like flames of fire, and they rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in various languages according to whatever the Spirit gave them to speak. Now there dwelt at Jerusalem devout men and Jews from every nation under heaven. And as the sound took place, all the people gathered together. And they were confused because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is that we hear every man in our own native language? All right. And then we have... Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those who dwell in Mesopotamia Jews and Capetians and those from Pontus and Asia Minor and those from the region of Pygra, Pam Pamphylia and of Egypt and of the regions of Libya near Serene and those who have come from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. 
And those from Crete, Arabians, behold, we hear them speak in our own tongues of the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and stunned, saying one to another, what does this mean? Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, what this means. Now, uh, one thing one thing to remember, um, this, all right, this, well, obviously, this comes to the book of Acts, but Luke is the person that wrote the book of Acts. And Luke, we have to remember here, Luke was not there. Okay, Luke, Luke compiled, and that's, and it's true for the gospel of Luke, too. Uh, he compiled his gospel, his acts, uh, by, not, not, not because... Not because he was there, uh, okay. Um, not because he was there, but he gathered information, uh, possibly from some eyewitnesses, whatever, and wrote this story. Um, and so uh, we we just need to, to remember that because there's some there there's some confusion about things. All right. Now. Pentecost, okay, Pentecost is really a Greek word, okay, and of course, the it, pente means five, uh, five or 50, I guess, it's, anyway, an Aramaic word is Pentecostia, um, and so what, okay, so what it was, as, as are um, most of or all of our Christian holidays coincide with the Jewish holiday because, of course, um, the the uh, uh, <laughs> well early Christianity was Jewish, so to speak, and so when they they observed the Jewish festivals, and then when Christianity came along, then they just put you know put our festivals beside it, um, and so. And in Jewish, the the festival, it was the festival of Shav, Shavuot, I think, and or the or it was called the first festival of the harvest. Um, and in in the very early times, it was it was it was a thankful. Uh, they 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 brought their their whatever their wheat, their crops and whatnot. And it was a celebration. And they thank you, thank you to God for their harvest. And then later it it became the commemor it was commemorative of Moses receiving the law, which is which was the Torah, the Ten Commandments, and seemingly and the other law. So that 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 was the the Jewish um observance. Now the Christian observance, um, okay, the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles after Jesus' ascension during this festival. Um, and one one thing one thing to note: remember, it was forty days after Easter that Jesus seemingly, um, after appearing. Uh, uh, to the disciples and whatnot uh, for 40 days that's when he ascended but then the fifth, uh, on the, the 50th day um, after Easter okay that's when um, that's that's when the Christians matched it up with the the uh, festival of Shabbat and essentially it does it, it is like the beginning of of the the christian church so to speak now but there's more to this now the meaning of pentecost all right pentecost was a new phenomenon remember the the flames of fire from the from the scripture um came down but and so it was a new phenomenon a new beginning it was the day god had chosen to give the world 
a new covenant to replace the old covenant that was given to Moses 1,600 years before. Now, essentially, what, what, the, what the old covenant basically, um, and and just applying parts parts of it to this, uh, the 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 old covenant was uh, the when you know, well, well, God first made the covenant with Abraham, and then Moses got the Ten Commandments, um, and 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 the law, and that basically. And the old covenant, of course, was the angry, uh, uh, wrathful God, whatever. And, of course, the new covenant, okay, the new covenant is not written on, was not written on stone tablets. Remember the Ten Commandments, they were, uh, they were written on, um, on, on the stone tablets. So, but the new covenant is to writ, be written on human hearts. And that's what, uh, of course, th that's the whole message too of the, the kingdom that message that Jesus taught. Um, but, but that's, uh, <clears throat> that, that's, that's the meaning here. All right. Now. Yeah, see, the old covenant was the law, sacrifice for forgiveness of sin and sins, punishing revengeful God, written on stone tablets. The new covenant, the spirit of the law, forgiveness through grace. God, who is the beloved father, written on the hearts of humankind. And always remember, it's the spiritual, the spiritual kingdom of heaven on earth. This is what this is what we have to keep thinking spiritually, uh, you know, throughout the Bible, <laughs> really. Okay. Now, this is this is just this is just a little um, a, a little thing here. All right. So, where where did it take place? Now. Um. Well, two things. Number one, different different um, scriptures say it say it different, and the way that it's worded, you, you just you don't know. All we know is that the for sure the the disciples were gathered together, okay, and and so but and then after the the tongues of fire came down and you know the wind came through the tongues of fire, uh, then. Then of course the next the next part of the scripture says well um, uh, the the people the people were amazed and whatnot so you don't know whether they were all whether all the people were there in in the room uh, at the same time or that you, you you just don't know so but um, the the they call they 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 call it the upper room, which is where the Last Supper took place, and then that's where they say uh, the the disciples were when the uh, tongues of fire and the came came down. However, another translation says that they were in the temple, all right, because. Um, be, because you have that scripture that next it says all the people heard them talking in tongues and whatnot. Well, there had to be other people around. So uh, it's and it's just a lesson you you don't you don't know and and you and really this is composed by Luke. So you know we don't want to take it factually, but I just thought we would um, we we would talk about it because I had all these questions and. Um, and so, so did the tongues of of of, of fire? Did the did the Holy Spirit descend on just the disciples, or everybody? Okay. And did the if if there were all those other people in the room, did they see the tongues of fire and hear the roar of the wind? Uh, because many 
many times I wish we had some spiritualists with us uh, because they 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 could really attest to this. Uh, but but usually and and when you and, and actually when you read about about after the resurrection and the people that Jesus only appeared to people that loved him and knew him. And so anyway, another, and I, I just wanted to bring this, just bring this up because, um, okay, the, the, the thing about the, the upper room and where the, where the um, uh, disciples were, okay, there's a, there's, there's a couple different theories. Now, one thing to know about Jerusalem, I don't know if you've ever been to the Holy Land, but in Jerusalem, um, there's, uh, it, it is a tourist place, obviously. And so, so various people or groups claim that certain things happened here, da 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 da. So there's, there, there could be two or three different places. One thing I noticed when I was there, it, it seemed to me like there's two or three different places that said Mary is buried here. Okay. And so anyway, that's, that's the idea. But, um, and, and traditionally uh, and tourist wise, they say that, that the, the, uh, the upper room, so to speak, it was a, was a, a building out, just outside of uh, Jerusalem, I think near Mount Olives and whatnot. And that's the tourist site. That's what they say. However, when, okay, when I, when I was, when I was in Jerusalem um, with a group of Jewish people, by the way, anyway, um, I wanted, I just wanted to find Aramaic stuff because I was like about four years into this and I was really, and I wanted to find Aramaic stuff. Well, Aramaic, you see, Aramaic, as you see here, is very close to Arabic. And of course, that's um, Arabic is the Palestinians and all of that. So so the Jewish tour group, they just really, you know, you know, they weren't interested. Anyway, I set out with another little girl from the group to find to find uh, the Aramaic and which was very difficult to find. But but we did find uh, this, um, it, it was way off the beaten path, but, but it was the uh, Syrian Orthodox Church and, and, and convent, and they claim that they're, um, they are in the upper room, okay, that that is where, where it occurred. And so my experience there and remember the the remember what it said about the tongues and about people talking in the different tongues, and of course then Peter, you know they they all they went out and they they healed and all of this. Well, we met I, I met this um, I met this little nun, okay, and she told us, uh, she told us healing stories that had occurred there, that would just kind of. You know, it would just kind of blow you away, and so uh, I just thought I I would show these. I I certainly because there was a presence there. It was it was um, and so I certainly would vote that that was probably the place. But again, you don't know in 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 Jerusalem. Uh, you know. Um, anyway. Uh, and by the way, I went well to Bethlehem, which is which of course is on the on the other the other side, so to speak. And you have to do all this um, all this security changing stuff and everything because it's in it was in Palestinian territory. And um, uh, it um, well, I had some background in this before I went, and so. Uh, it, it, it I'm, I'm not dis dis disrespecting anything as holy sites and everything, but you know, I but I did. I stood in line because everybody wanted to see the place where Jesus was born, and and I mean, Italia, I, the 
it, it you know what what it was it was a it was a square of glass about eight or ten feet below below what was there and I just anyway I, I won't say anymore but it's just the way I don't know it's just it's just the way the that you know the tourism is and whatnot anyway just thought I'd bring that up all right so what is so what is the the idea of speaking in tongues and I I taken this is this is from the commentary because I, I thought we would read it and then you could understand it better than my talking about it. So it seems that during that time, Semites were gifted in learning other languages very easily. As a general rule, shepherds, fishermen, farmers, and even unlettered people were able to speak two, three, or four languages, including several dialects. In the Near East, a dialect is often considered as a distinct language, not so much because of fundamental differences in words, but because of the differences in idioms and pronunciation. The reason for these differences was the lack of printing and of general communications between the tribes and some regions, even a few miles of distance between two towns creates a distinct difference in pronunciation. Now, so so Dr. Lamsa, uh, Dr. Lamsa in the in the commentaries um, attributes the speaking in all the different all the different dialects um, as the disciples actually knew these languages and they um, you know and then they they started to converse in these languages and again let me t let me just say that nobody knows for sure uh what you know what what it was um and um and and the other the other thing that was confounding the situation was that the most most of the people well, and most of the apostles uh, were Galileans and the Jewish people, the, the, the Jude Jewish people in Judea, they really had no time for Galileans. And Jesus, of course, was a Galilean. So anyway, that's that's the idea of speaking in tongues. Now, we know, OK, we, we know in our world today that the speaking in tongues has has been um, formulated, so to speak, into a specific theology, um, and uh, the Pentecostal uh, churches use that as their center centerpiece uh, for their theology, and you know um, there the the there has been, you know, because Pentecostals do a lot of healing. And um, so, uh, so they base it on, they base it on this. And uh, uh, they, as I say, they, they do, they do, do um, healings and prayers and whatnot. And, and they speak in tongues. Now, I really, I've not, I've only heard, I've only heard, I actually, one person uh, speak. I, I don't know some kind, some kind of tongues. I do not know what it was, but they say I've never been to a Pentecostal. If somebody here has, speak up. But you know, but they do have a thing where they do, and they, they. So, anyway, all right. So let. So now we we'll just go. Now, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit in Judaism, which is what was, re remember, Christianity wasn't around yet. So this was what the, the, uh, the disciples uh, were experiencing. This was their, their background as to what the Holy Spirit was. So in Judaism, the Holy Spirit is the divine force 
quality and influence of God over your universe or over his creatures. Okay, so now comes the now comes now comes uh, the rub. Uh, wh who and what is the Holy Spirit today? All right, and so what comes into play here is the Trinity. Okay, the Trinity in Christian doctrine is the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons in one Godhead. The doctrine of the Trinity is considered to be one of the central Christian affirmations about God. Yes, it is. Now, I'm going to say I'm going to say a few things about this because um, because the Trinity it is a doctrine. Okay. Now they they will point to different uh, different. Um, passages of scripture uh, to kind of justify this, but it is not biblical. It is the doctrine. And what when it came about, it came about at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And it came about because of all the arguments about Jesus. Was Jesus God? Uh, was he a human being? Was he whatever? In any way, the Trinity says, okay, uh, Jesus was God, and, and all three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all, okay, I think most of you know about that. Uh, now, the problem when we're teaching, when, when, when we're teaching and looking at the Spirit, so to speak, and the Spirit of the Word, one thing, and Eastern Christianity versus Western Christianity, Jesus in Eastern Christianity and early Christianity, um, Jesus was a human being, just like all the rest of us. But he was the finest example of a human being. And but when and and when see this this all the councils of Nicaea and whatnot came about through Constantine. And and so Constantine, because all those arguments and stuff, he decided they were going to just decide what it is. And of course, he made it the state religion. And that's what you would believe. So, but, and the problem, the problem that that you have when you, with, with, with the Trinity and this approach is that when you think of, of God, as a person, then things get all messed up because God is not a person. Okay, God is spirit. Now let's see if let's see how we can pull this. Now, okay, so so what was happening with with, with the disciples? Okay, the the disciples had just witnessed Jesus dying on the cross and the resurrection and Jesus' appearances to them after the resurrection. Um, and, and of course, prior to, prior to this, okay, the disciples, like all the Jewish people, had expected a Messiah for Israel, a, a king, a, you know, a, a man, so to speak, who would, who would, come and fight for Israel and restore Israel, whatnot. Of course they of course they believed that because that was their background before Jesus came along. Okay. But but their years spent with Jesus had opened the door, but but only slightly to the idea of Jesus as the spiritual Messiah reigning over a spiritual kingdom. Jesus' death and resurrection opened the spiritual eyes of the disciples. But at that point, after the resurrection, when it, they, they were still not quite ready um, to, you, you know, to, to set it in cement. They, 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 had, they were believed, they were starting to believe that Jesus, yes, 
this, the, he is the Messiah. And of course, they 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 were thinking about everything that Jesus had taught them, uh, but they still weren't quite ready yet to go out and teach. And so the Spirit descending made disciples aware of the presence and power of Spirit, God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that they're talking about. And that we talk about and whatnot is God, power of God, Holy Spirit in their lives. They were totally convinced then that Jesus was the true Messiah and that presence and power, his presence and power would always be with them. And so, more so than you know, the Pentecost being, yes, it was the beginning of Christianity. And and Lord, if you look it up, there's all other kinds of things. But um, they were inspired, moved by the Holy Spirit, so to speak, to carry out Jesus' teachings at all costs. And if, 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 you, if you think about it, um. Wait, just hold. I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. So. Um. Jesus' disciples and followers, by completely surrendering themselves to his teachings, and giving up all that this physical world offers, were able to see and move in a spiritual world. They were empowered to conquer the physical and material forces and clothe themselves with God's spirit. Um, now this is, I was gonna put it on there again, but now th this is Dr. Lomsa. This is directly um, Dr. Lomsa. This is why their words could reach the hearts of the people and transform them. Now. Um, when we're talking about it, it, it says they clothe themselves with God's spirit. Um, have, have, I don't know if you, if you've ever, and, and we do do experienced like a, a holy man, so to speak, or, or whatnot. And you, 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 you feel that presence. I'm not talking about them speaking, but but there's a there's a presence about it, and 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 that's that's what that's what they're talking about here, and Jesus, the disciples of course had been with Jesus, okay, and they watched what he did because remember Jesus set an example big time. Jesus demonstrated his teachings. And so they had been with Jesus. Uh, they, they knew his teachings. They saw what he did. Um, and they, they understood now with the, the spirit, they understood, you know, why Jesus um, allowed himself, so to speak, to go to the cross and die on the cross. And they understand, and they, they understood um, that, you don't die and that Jesus died for his cause and he cause and he never gave up. So and, and and of course the the other the other reason okay that they 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 finally got it is perhaps why Jesus sent the sent the Holy Spirit. Um okay when when they were when Jesus was still here, all right he Jesus attempted to show them the the spiritual side of things, if you remember the transfiguration, and to show the the disciples that that you don't die and that that you're remember the spirit of I think Ezekiel or whatnot came back in a transfiguration. So so Jesus, of course, he had tried to teach them this, but they they could not know it and feel it until his his death and resurrection 
until they receive the spirit. And, you know, it really goes, it really goes that way nowadays. If you're studying with a teacher, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot, I mean, you know, and you're really devoted and whatnot, as long as you are studying under that teacher, you're not going to go out and teach and whatnot because you're still, you're still there. You're still learning and whatnot, but you're still under that, that umbrella. So once you get out from the wings, then, then you can, with, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, then you can do it. So, and so that's why their words could reach the hearts of people and transform them. All right. Now, Dr. Lamsa brought up, brought up another thing, and um, I, I, I think I think it's it's good that we. Um, okay, most Christians believe that the Holy Spirit was not working in the world until Jesus sent it. In other words, th that the Holy Spirit didn't exist until Jesus uh, came and and sent it. And we have this, and, and we have the the scripture as to why why they say Christians say uh, that they didn't. So I've got both Lamsa and KGD, and uh, so Lamsa is he said this concerning the Spirit, which they who believe in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So they used, they just used this and said, well, okay, the Holy Spirit wasn't around until Jesus sent. Um, but an interesting thing, I, I put the KJV in here. And um, and it's it's bas basically the same. Um, but notice, and this is this is true uh, from the, the King James Bible, they talk about the Holy Ghost. Um, and now there, there may be a current revised King James uh, Bible that uses the Holy Spirit, but it's very interesting uh, that K King James uses Holy Ghost. And if you if you uh, compared when we were talking about uh, Jesus giving up His Spirit on the cross, uh, remember it in the, the K King James says. He gave up the ghost, and that's several times in King James. So anyway, that was just an interesting side about this. But so Dr. Lamsa then says, okay, that's not so, okay, because the Holy Spirit is God, and because God is spirit. And if you think about it, when you know that God is spirit, then that answers that whole question that you may have been worrying about for years, that how can God be everywhere? Well, he's everywhere because it's spirit, and spirit is everywhere. And this is the same Holy Spirit that spoke to the prophets, um, to Abraham, it's the same spirit. So what he's saying is, you know, God has been God has been around forever, and and uh, and the God God is the Holy Spirit they're talking about here. And he says there is no time in the history of religion when the Holy Spirit was silent and inactive. And of course, he's right. And there is no place in the universe where God's spirit cannot be found and including in us. And I, I did add that, but but that that's part of it, including in us. So now we can we can kind of use this, I think. Um, those who change their lives and turn to God and the teachings of Jesus become great lights that shine in the darkness and find themselves in a spiritual state free from all human limitations. And we could discuss that for days, but we don't have time. When people turn to God and surrender everything 
to God's truth of justice and compassion, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit that is always available to those who are ready to work with it. The Pentecostal experience has always been with the human family, but they must be ready to receive it and follow through with it regardless of cost. Only truth functioning by the spirit can set the human family free from injustice, violence, hatred, bigotry, and mistrust. And I just I just have to add here that um, this is straight from the teachings of Jesus and the message of, of the kingdom. Okay. And so, in conclusion, um, I, I, I just had this little blurb here um, that to me is so applicable today. I mean, we are already in the presence of God. God is, I mean, God is ever present, but what's absent is awareness. And that is ever so true. So the spirit of God, which is the presence, the counsel, has always been with humankind, but we must become aware of it. We become aware by turning to God and through the practice of Jesus' teachings, which will then set the human family free from injustice, violence, hatred, bigotry, and mistrust. Okay, I know I, I know I'm probably running over a little bit, but um, okay, so that's uh, that's it for Pentecost. Um, I, I hope we've got something more out of it than just it's a holo, it's a holy day and 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 all of that. So. Let's, oh, so, you know, based on, based on this and based on when I was looking up stuff on Google and all that, people were always asking the question, how can I receive the Holy Spirit? So that has inspired me. Next week, we're going to do prayer and the Holy Spirit. Because for those of you that aren't that 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 don't have been around a long time, the the idea uh the idea of prayer uh from from the from the Aramaic is 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 central to all of what we talked about tonight. Is it's uh it, it's it's central to connecting with God and and hearing God and whatnot, so it just came to me, and that that's that's what we'll do um, uh, next week because we haven't done prayer in a while. So, uh, but it because it is really a very important part of it. So, okay, thank you for your don your contributions, and um, and we're done. <laughs>